Welcome to the Open Forum. Once again, we have the privilege and the pleasure. It's really a, a very great spiritual pleasure. Not, it's not something superficial or, or uh, something that we're just tickled about. It's something that deep in our hearts we're glad that we can look again into the Word of God to learn truth. Because uh, uh, we, as we work together at, at this verse or that verse, we are learning more and more truth from the Bible. And this is particularly of uh, concern today when we know that God is revealing a great amount of additional truth because the book that was sealed in the days of Daniel has been opened, and it's only been open for about 21 years, and uh, therefore, therefore we're still learning. We've learned a great many things, but that doesn't mean that now we uh, that we're there. We are, we are. There's verse after verse that we can still look at and learn something uh, from it, or find a, uh, find a further substantiation uh, to the uh, truths that we have already learned. But this is your program. We want to hear from you. And shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. Uh, I'm on the air now? <laughs> yes, you're on the air. Go ahead. Okay, hi. Uh, I'd like to make a statement first, and then I will ask a question. The people, you know, some people call and ask about uh, whether... Saddam Hussein or you know, Hitler went uh, to hell or heaven. You know, the, if you take uh, Paul as an example, he was even a terrible sinner. Of course, not that I am not, but you know, uh, but God saved Paul. I mean, so I think it's uh, immaterial what happened to those folks. I think we need to concentrate more on you know our families and ourselves and all that. And ask the God to. I, I, I'm say. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not following you. It, uh, you're asking some kind of a question. Would you repeat it very slowly, very carefully? What is your question? You know, the first one was my, a statement about you know people calling about uh, Hitler uh, and Saddam Hussein, whether they have been saved or not. Uh, so I, I think it's the material for us uh, to know all that. Uh, do you think, uh, you know, it is uh, something we should know about? Or Well, you, I, you, you're wondering what is God going to do, truly evil man? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, take a man like Saddam Hussein, who undoubtedly was guilty of killing thousands of people, and he was tried, and finally he was uh, hung, and then they very carefully uh, watched over his b body after he had been hung, after he was dead, to make sure it wouldn't be desecrated. And in actuality, he was punished no more than someone who had uh, committed a, a, death, uh, a crime that called for death but was just one uh, thousandth as terrible as Sodom's. Uh, uh, crime was. And the same is true with God's program. When we're dead, when a person is dead, they are dead. They have no more conscious existence, whether they're Hitler or Sodom or, or the, the most ugly sinner you can think about in the whole wide world, or whether it's somebody who just did not, who was not saved and yet had lived uh, basically a fairly moral, decent life. The fact is, when they're dead, they're dead. And that is God's, pro uh, God's uh, punishment program. Now, we may not, we may not like it, but uh, we may, you know, <laughs> there are lots of people, when a man like Saddam Hussein was hanged, they were disappointed. Oh, why couldn't we make him suffer some uh, to compensate for all the suffering he caused in so many lives? Well, you can't. That's what the that's what the uh, the penalty is, and 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 we have to be satisfied with that. But thank so, you. Uh, I have a question, though. You know, yeah. my ha I have a two, uh, four-year-old daughter, 
And uh, when I was reading Jeremiah, she remembered the name, and she was asking me where he was, and I told her that he's in heaven. Is it true? Is Jeremiah in, in, heaven? He in heaven? Well, in his soul existence, he is. His body is in the grave. And when Christ comes uh, on May 21, 2011, his body will be resurrected, a glorified spiritual body, eternal body, just like everybody else's. Uh, he died just like anybody dies, but uh, because he was a true believer he, he, and had been given a new resurrected soul, as every true believer, uh, he is in heaven today in his soul existence like every true believer is in heaven if he has died. But thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. Um, can we look at Psalm uh, 45, verses 11 through 15? Psalm 45. I mean, excuse me, Psalm 44. I'm sorry. Psalm 44. Psalm 44. Verses 11 through 15. Let's look at that. Right. Psalm 44. There we read... 11, verse 11. Thou yes. hast given us like sheep for meat, and hast scattered us among the heathen. Thou sellest thy people for naught, and dost not increase thy wealth by their price. Thou makest us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to them that are round about us. Uh, thou madest us a proverb or a byword among the heathen, a shaking of the head among the people. My confusion is continually before me, and the shame of my face hath covered me. Uh, and in, uh, in all of this, look at verse 17. All of this has come upon us, yet have we not forgotten thee, neither have we dealt falsely in thy covenant. Our heart is not turned back, neither have our steps declined from thy way. Though thou hast sore broken us in the place of dragons and covered us with the shadow of death, if we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a strange God, shall not God search us out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Uh, your question is, what is God talking about here? And I, I admit that this is a, a, as I read this, it is a difficult passage. It is the... Uh, 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 it, it, it appears, and I, really I shouldn't be saying too much about this because I'll be speculating and, and I, can, I can say wrong things when I speculate, definitely. But you must, there is two possibilities, or one possibility. Uh, first of all, somehow we've missed something, and this is really talking about someone who is not saved, and, and uh, then he's, God is talking about his judgment upon that person. Or the other possibility, and I can't tell just on this quick reading whether uh, this is possible, and that is that if we're a true believer, we fill up the suffering of the Lord Jesus. Now, when Christ came, for example, to demonstrate how he uh, paid for our sins, uh, he was the perfect man. He perfect. No sin in him. Uh, no one could uh, could honestly or rightfully claim that he did something wrong. He was perfect. And yet he was reviled, he was spit upon, he, he was uh, uh, treated very, very shabbily, he was shamed. And that is what we can expect if we are a child of God. We, uh, 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 Christ came to bring the gospel as well as uh, demonstrate how he was the gospel. Uh, but now we who are his body, that is the true believers, we continue the suffering of Christ. The New Testament speaks about that. That is, we, uh, we repre are uh, representing the Lord Jesus Christ to this world. Uh, we also will suffer as he suffered, even though he was not guilty of anything at all, as he was sharing the gospel. And that is the other possibility. But I'm not able to be definitive because I have not worked on this passage. 
Okay, thank you very much, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you, Brother Camping. Um, how are you this evening? Very well, thank you. Uh, listen, in, in the Gospel, Jesus says, uh, pick up your uh, cross and follow me. Yeah. Um, do you know what uh, verse that is, where in the Gospel that is? Well, friend, I do not. I do not. Okay. But you remember that, right? I, I yeah. remember that. Well, now, how how would you um, how would you explain the way to do that? And how would, and especially in the materialistic world, the monetary well, it's, world it's, that it's, we live in, how, how it's do the cross is Christ, of course. He is the one who became a curse for us, and it's just exactly what I have been speaking about that we we identify with him as he came uh, to. Uh, show us what the gospel is. He also came to bring the gospel, and it, but it's totally identified with Christ as he came to demonstrate how he, uh, how he was cursed, how he was uh, uh, shamed as he brought the as he came, and uh, that is what we have to uh, plan. That we too are going to be shamed by our fellow man. We're going to be. Uh, uh, scandalized <laughs> we're going to be vilified uh, because we're representing the Lord Jesus Christ who is the enemy of the world the world uh, doesn't want Christ they do not want Christ they follow their se themselves and are under the authority of Satan right right but I was I was wondering um I'm pretty sure that meant, is that kind of mean to grow in his righteousness? I mean, you can't really accept the Lord and follow him if you're not, uh, like it says in the book of James, well, we grow in, of his death, right? as we grow in righteousness, uh, we grow in grace is the word that we use and we find in, I think, in Second Peter. Uh, we grow in grace. It means that as we learn more and more from the Bible and as we consequently walk more and more humbly uh, because that is the characteristic the major characteristic of the child of God more humbly and more faithfully to the word of God we are growing in grace it is growing in the word of God it's growing in righteousness it's one way of speaking about it although the Bible does not use that language it, I think it uses the language growing in grace but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum thank you mr camping um i was wondering I, this has bothered me for a long time um in john 17 where jesus said he had finished the work that god had sent him to do was he referring to before the foundation of the world or at the cross? And I'll take your answer over the phone. Thank you. Well, okay. John, John 17, verse... Uh, what verse is that? I wish that our caller had given us the verse that would save our time here. But uh, uh, in in uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the verse, and therefore it's not very wise for me I'm to talk. I'm sorry. Uh, so shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, uh, uh, I'm trying to find out if uh, 40 has uh, a big significance in uh, Pentecost. I'm sorry? I'm trying to find out if uh, 40, the number 40, has any significance the number. for uh, Pentecost. And I'm trying to find out if... Uh, when Christ was crucified, uh, and, and not not in Pentecost that I'm aware of. The number forty is pretty used consistently in the Bible to indicate testing. 
Israel was tested 40 years in the wilderness, they, whether they would be faithful to the Word of God. Uh, Noah was put was on uh, Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, and so Israel was tested. What would they do while their leader is gone? They, in both cases, they failed the test. Uh, we find that Jesus was 40 days and 40 nights being tempted of Satan, uh, and he did not fail the test. He remained absolutely faithful. Uh, 40 is pretty consistently used to signify testing. Uh, what are, uh, we're being proved, proved by God, or uh, tested by God, whether we will be faithful to the Word of God or not. Hey, um, when Christ was crucified, he was crucified on, it was, <clears throat> I read something that it, it was, uh, Friday was the Sabbath, Saturday was the Sabbath, a high Sabbath, I, and, uh, Sunday was a, a Sabbath, I guess, for the new era. I, I'm sorry, what is your question? Well, I'm trying to find out if that would throw off all those Sabbaths. He was, he was crucified on the day before the seventh day Sabbath. Uh, that's why they wanted his body off the, and the bodies of the two thieves next to him off the cross before sundown, because sundown was the official beginning of the Sabbath day, the seventh day Sabbath. And then that is re-emphasized on Sunday morning when he arose as the women came and uh, God says it in the end of the Sabbath as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbath. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping, I spoke with you last Thursday, the last caller and you would not allow me to speak. You kept rudely over-talking over me and cutting me off. And I think this is a, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is supreme, supremely important. In 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 17 and 18, could you please read that? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17 and 18, we read... And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are not, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now, what is your question? Would you agree that verse 17 and 18 is referring to the resurrection in 33 A.D., which the rest of the chapter is speaking about? No, no. Yeah, he's so not, uh, excuse me, excuse me. He arose before the foundation of the world. When he arose uh, in, uh, in, in uh, A.D. 33, he was demonstrating that he uh, uh, was put in a tomb and rose again, but he was not in a tomb in his soul existence. It was not a part, uh, an actual part, of the atonement. Uh, it was actually a demonstration of a part of the atonement that he had risen. Which resurrection is verse 4 then? Hello? Yes. Which resurrection is in verse 4 referring to? In verse 4? Uh huh. That he was buried and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, in that case, it can refer to the demonstration that he is showing. That, but in actuality, that demonstration had no atoning substance to it. The atoning substance was completely completed before the foundation of the world. And you have to always remember what he, what, when he was shamed on the cross, when he became a curse for us, or became a curse there, and when he was stripped naked, which was a horribly shameful thing, when he died, when he uh, was, his body was put in the grave, none of that was, uh, was being used to make payment for sin, but it was a demonstration how he suffered in order to make payment for our sin. So in actuality, you're saying there's 
the resurrection in 4 is 33, and the resurrection in 17 and 18 is before the world began. Well, it, 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 it's, it's the principle here. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. All right, now we can uh, interpret that. Yes, that is what happened before the foundation of the world, and uh, that was demonstrated in A.D. 33. And, uh, and uh, then after that he was seen of Peter and so on. So there's no contradiction, uh, there's no problem at all. It's just that we now have a lot more understanding of what was really going on. We can understand why, for example, when he was buried in 33 A.D., in his soul, it was, he was not in the tomb. How could that be? Because if he, if, if uh, part of the, the Bible says that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And so his soul had to die. Well, it didn't happen in A.D. 33. When did, did it happen? Thou wilt not leave my soul in, in hell. Uh, that is, in the grave. It has to identify with before the foundation of the world. On the cross, Jesus said, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. He didn't say my soul. And what you're saying now is contradicting verse 46 in chapter 15. I'm, so, what, I'm What is your question now? Well, first I said that when Jesus was on the cross, he said, Into thy hands I commend my spirit, not my yeah. soul. And in verse 46... Yeah, verse 46, I, 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 excuse me. He, when he said on the cross to the thief next to him, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And that meant that we know that when a, when a, a believer dies, in, he has become saved that at the moment of death in his soul existence, he goes to be with Christ in heaven. He goes to heaven. And Christ says, Today thou shalt be with me. And so it means that uh, some part of Christ was not put in a tomb. It says his body was put in a tomb, but it did not see corruption. There wasn't even any payment going on when he was in the tomb uh, because part of the of uh, the penalty for sin is that our body corrupts. But the fact is that it does say, in, the, in uh, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, in the grave, and, uh, and that would have had to have happened before the foundation of the world. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, yes. Mr. Camping. Let me turn off my uh, perhaps um, uh, many people have been calling in considering uh, about the, um, you know, uh, Christ dying before the foundation of the earth and yeah. uh, AD 33 being, not being a, a demonstration. Some time ago you explained to us a verse and I find it very useful. Perhaps uh, this could help remind them. And that is in First Peter chapter 1 verse 20. First Peter chapter yeah. 1. And uh, verse 20, let's look at that. First Peter, chapter 1, verse 20. There we read, Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. That is, manifest means it, it was a demonstration. It has shown to us in this last time, but it was foreordained. Now, this, by, this verse doesn't give us the meaning of foreordained, but it, uh, it, it, uh, other verses help us to understand that indeed he, it, it was foreordained and accomplished before the foundation of the world. Yes, I thought that was a pretty good explanation from this verse. Uh, there is another question which I've been uh, uh, trying trying to figure out, and that is, some uh, uh, some time ago you 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 showed us a verse uh, about uh, how the Bible gives us gives us patterns or examples of how to break down numbers, which actually uh, are like words. Do you think you can remember which verse that was? Because I haven't been able to locate it. C concerning breaking down numbers? Yes. 
Yeah, well, for example, we have this beautiful illustration that Christ, we know, was crucified on April 1, 33 A.D. That we know with great accuracy. We also know with great accuracy that the completion of and 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 in when he was crucified, that was demonstrating the atonement. That's where uh, that's demonstrating how our sins are paid for by Christ enduring the wrath of God. Okay, then in on. Uh, uh, May 21, 2011, that is the day when our salvation is completed in every sense of the word. It is uh, it, because we receive our re- resurrected bodies. We're caught up to be with Christ on that day. And that is, everything has been completed. Now we are uh, inheriting the kingdom of God and will forever be with Christ I will never, never again have anything to do with planet Earth. Okay, now, when we look at the timeline between the two, it breaks down into the numbers 5 times 10 times 17 times 5 times 10 times 17, right to the very day. 5 is is a number that spiritually uh, signifies the atonement, what happened at the cross. That is, God is demonstrating the fact that He made payment for our sin. Ten is a number that indicates the completeness of whatever is in view. Uh, and, uh, And 17 is a number that spiritually demonstrates heaven. And so we find here that that number of days is exactly five that is, it goes from the atonement completely to the final completion of our salvation, the rapture, at which time, which is signified by the number 10 times 17, when we are caught up to heaven. Our, our, our finally, our, uh, we're, uh, we're uh, uh, finished with this earth altogether. How marvelous that ties in exactly with what is what is, what is in view with the numbers tie in with what is in view we have to pause for this message in John 21 we have the example of God records the catching of 153 fish in a net that did not break and we know that those fish represent the true believers who are caught by Christ, that is, they are absolutely going to be brought into to shore, which represents heaven. They are, they are not, uh, they're not, uh, uh, not, the net did not break. And when we break number 153 down, we find it's 3 times 3 times 17. It is absolutely God's purpose. And it's soon to happen that, that, uh, these are going to be brought to heaven. Uh, and so again, the number itself echoes, very closely echoes what is being taught by the language of the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Rabbi Camping? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Jason Cohen from New York City. Oh, excuse me. I'm not a rabbi. Uh, well, okay. Rabbi is the word <laughs> means teacher. That's okay. Uh, I, you can call me a teacher. Go ahead. Uh, What's your question? No, the reason I say that is because uh, I'm, you know, I'm Jewish, so I grew up in the synagogue, so I'm used to saying rabbi. Um, I was just wondering, would you ever think about sending a uh, family radio mission team to Israel? You know, Jews for Jesus went there, and uh, they were they had a good reception, from what I heard, and. Wouldn't it be great, like, maybe the last week of, uh, you know, like right before May 21st, you could send a team of missionaries to Israel? And I, would I, you ever I, think I, of that? Because, you know, they would accept. I'm, I'm Jewish, and I and I loved hearing about Christ. And, uh, you know, well, a lot of Jews... That I- it, it, could, uh, it could be considered. I... I, I uh... Uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm not really in charge of those mission trips, but I'll talk to whoever is, and and uh, it's it's a thought, but 
I, I don't know what the plans are. Okay, just um, two more questions. Um, Re remember, just, oh. excuse me, remember, there are more Jewish people, at least I understand this, living in New York City than in, uh, than in Israel. Is that true? Uh, I think it's the second largest uh, Jewish population after uh, Tel Aviv, I believe. Um, right. I live in my my town is mostly ninety percent Jewish anyway, so uh, anyway, I'm all around it. And, uh, all what, is, what is um, your question? Um, can you tell us about uh, the missionaries in um, in Zambia? What happened? And also, do you plan to do a debate on uh, July twenty seventh and July twenty eighth with James? Oh, uh, no, the the uh, uh, there there were some people who were protesting and it would begin we began to see that it was not not uh, not wise to continue to press in other words you know there is a there are rules that god gives you don't cast your pearls before swine so it became it became uh, wise it, uh, as near as we could tell that they, they leave the country at that point but uh, that's uh, uh, it's it, it it wasn't <laughs> no, there was no no damage done of any kind. Nobody was harmed. Nobody. It just it just was a local incident that did occur. Okay, and you're going to be doing a debate next week with James White. Uh, well, uh, the Lord willing, yes, that will be done. It, that is, I've been asked to if I would be willing to uh, 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 to uh, be on a radio station and and be interviewed and. And I said yes, and of course I realized that <laughs> any time a radio station interviews me, they want somebody there who has the opposite uh, viewpoint, and and they were able to uh, get uh, m uh, Mr. White to uh, take that position, and so uh, uh, maybe he calls it a debate. To me, it's just a matter of a uh, possibility of interviewing concerning what we're teaching. And uh, all right, just my last question. Can you just tell me the year that the Apostle Paul uh, was converted on the road to Damascus? Because that would help me in my timeline of history. The year Paul was saved on the road to I, Damascus. I, I don't do not know. The Bible doesn't give us enough information. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you, Mr. Camping. I found that reference in John 17, 4, where Jesus said he had finished the work which the Father had given him to do. John 17, verse 4. Yes, sir. Let's look at that. There we read, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Oh, okay. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work thou gavest me to do to do well uh, the, actually the work he had been given to do is to make payment for our sins and that was done before the foundation of the world uh, insofar as his work here uh, in demonstrating no that had not been completed yet but that was just a demonstration uh, uh, that he still had to go to the cross and he still had uh, to demonstrate how he suffered and how he he had still his body still had to go to the, be put in the grave to demonstrate how he rose from the grave he still had to pour out the holy spirit that would not happen until about 50 days after he arose from the grave and uh, so but in so far as the 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 real essence of the work that was all accomplished before the foundation of the world Okay, then when he said in John 19:30 that um, it is finished, that was the demonstration. The that uh, that was the demonstration of the work he had on the cross. Yes, to okay. do on the cross. It was not a demonstration of how he uh, rose from the grave. That still had to be followed. That that still had to happen. But but insofar as the the suffering, the the uh, shame. That he had become a curse. They had, they had stripped him naked, and he was in, the, in a public spectacle of enormous shame. And uh, uh, that had all been done, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. 
Hi, good evening, Mr. Camping. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Yes, Mr. Camping, I have a question. Um, when Jesus, uh, the apostles, the 12 apostles were saved, right? Well, 11 of them the were... 11, yes, yeah, except for Judah, the Judas rest were saved, not, right? Right, right, yes, from everything we know, yes. All right, uh, my question is, how come, given the fact that they were saved, that they uh, forsake him when he was arrested, they, they all uh, abandoned him and ran away? Well, Can you answer I, that question, please? Well, sure, just because we become saved, it doesn't mean we have... Our full knowledge of what God's plan is. And my, my, they were seeing absolutely strange things. For example, even after Christ arose, they had a terrible time believing that he had arisen from the grave. God, uh, Christ had to upbraid them, we read in the Gospel of Mark, I believe. Uh, he, he almost had to get angry with them because they were not un understanding that he had arisen. Uh, this, this, this whole thing was so strange, so unexpected, even though he had told them. But, but uh, uh, and, and you can believe that if it was hard for them to believe it, think how hard it is for someone who just reads about it in the Bible to believe it. But God has to open our spiritual ears and eyes in order that we will really come to the right understanding. Well, thank you, Mr. Coffey, for your answer. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Harold, that you? Yes. Hello? Go ahead with uh, your call. All right. Okay, Harold, I do have a couple questions for you that ordinarily I wouldn't call into your show here, but... If you're nothing else, you're pretty knowledgeable about the Bible, so maybe you can help me out here. All right, question number one. I uh, There's a gentleman I know of, I guess I'd call him that, in Minnesota, and he every once in a while he'll refer to the Lord Jesus Christ as Jebus, J-E-B-U-S. And what I'd like to know is, because he's not telling me and nobody else seems to know, where did that name come from and does it have any particular significance? Oh, well, J J E B U S. I don't know yes, where right. that came from. I don't know. I don't know. Is that in the Bible? You know, I couldn't find it, and that's why I called you because, like I said, well, nobody I, else seems I, to know I, it. And... I'm sorry. I don't know anything about well, that. I can't help you. That's fine. Uh, you know, I, at least you know I could ask. Now, uh, the next question is the same individual, and this is a little bit tricky, but uh, you know. We know that we're saved by grace, according to the uh, the epistles of Paul. Well, this particular individual says, because Jesus Christ never specifically, uh, in his uh, words that are recorded, said anything about being saved by grace, uh, you know, he mostly talks about fulfilling the law. Now, therefore, he this gentleman concludes that we are not saved by grace. That's all in error. And, in fact, the only way we're going to be saved is by keeping the letter of the law. Now, my question is, uh, it's kind of like the word rapture, which doesn't appear in the Bible, but the principle does, you know, in other words, the principle does appear in, say, First Thessalonians, for example. All right, being saved by grace, is there any particular scripture that you can point to where the Lord Jesus Christ would have laid down this principle? Well, you know, we're saved by the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the fact that he was, did all the work. To save us by grace, you have been saved through faith, and that faith is really speaking about the Lord Jesus. He, his name, one of the names that God has assigned to him is the name faithful, because that word faith in uh, is the work. The faith is a work, and Christ did all the work to save us. And so, are the and now are the words of Christ more important? than the rest of the Bible? No, the whole Bible is the Word of God. Uh, remember, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is, the God, uh, Christ is, is God Himself. And everything in the Bible proceeds out of the mouth of God, whether we're speaking about God the Father or God Christ, as Christ or God the Holy Spirit. They all came out of the mouth of God. 
uh, including those words that Jesus spoke when he was on earth and are recorded in the Bible. But they're no more divine and no more holy than any other words in the Bible. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Cameron, how are you tonight? Very well, thank you. That verse you were looking for, uh, the gentleman called about taking up the cross, that's in the book of Matthew. I'm sorry, Mark, chapter 8, verses 34 and Take 35. Take up your cross and follow me, yes. yes you you the, know, the, it, it's typified by, remember when Jesus was going on his way uh, uh, from uh, the uh, trial to yes. uh, uh, being hung on the cross, there was Simon of Cyrene who uh, helped him to carry the cross. Well, that had nothing to do with Simon helping him make the payment or demonstrate the payment. It was simply that uh, that uh, that uh, we, uh, uh, as the body of Christ, suffer as he did bef uh, because his suffering was not in that he was carrying that cross. His suffering was that he hung on that cross. Uh, that's where the demonstration was. That's where he became a curse. Or when they stripped him naked, and and he and anyone who is hung, hung on a cross is uh, is being cursed of God. Well, let's take a look at Mark chapter eight, verses um, thirty-four and thirty-five. Let's look at that, please. Eight chapter thirty-five. Yeah. Mark eight. Um, Mark eight. Thirty-four and thirty-five. All right, let's look at that. Mark eight. Mark 8, verse. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his wife for my sake and the gospel, the same shall save it. That is, when we take up his cross, we suffer for it by him. You know, we read in, the, in Ephesians or one of these passages where it says uh, uh, where God indicates that we complete the suffering that uh, Christ uh, endured because you see he came to bring the gospel and we also as his body bring the gospel and so as we take up his cross take up his cross that is we take up the cause of of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the atonement, the cause, the, uh, all that goes with the atonement, the curse that was there, and all, everything, and we and we uh, rep and we represent Christ as He is suffering to bring the gospel to the world. Uh, that we do have a part in. Okay, and what is it saying in verse thirty-five? For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whosoever loses his life for my sake. And the gospel will save it. What's that saying there? Well, if if we are if we to to lose our life means you know we're creatures of this world. This world is where the action is. This is where we seek to find uh, our joy, our careers, our everything, and this we try to make get the most out of this life. But if we become a child of God, this life becomes very unimportant. It, our focus now is on the life to come. We realize our inheritance, the new heaven and the new earth, is infinitely more wonderful uh, than, uh, than anything in this world. And so we, we uh, really take our eyes off of of the importance of this world and focus them on the next world and we do that by trying to be as obedient as possible to the word of God but thank you uh, and, and so from the, from, the, from the unsaved vantage point we're throwing away this life after here oh this is where this is where uh, it's great isn't it isn't this where uh, we can uh, really uh, uh, become wealthy and find our supreme happiness, uh, and you're throwing it away. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But uh, t let me tell you, 
I have my mind on something that's infinitely more wonderful and it is the fact that there's a new heaven and a new earth that I am going to be co-heirs with the Lord Jesus and it's forevermore. This world just goes for a little while till I die. But my, I, when I get to heaven, that's going to go on forever and ever and ever. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. I just had a question for you. What? Are you going to be on the air the last, uh, the day before, uh, the last day of the, the end of the world? Oh, we'll wait about it. We'll wait for that when we get there. I'm, 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 I've got to prepare for tomorrow and the next day. And, uh, we'll, all I know is that, uh, I and Family Radio are in completely in God's hands and, and uh, we have a job to do right now. And, and uh, what's, what we're going to do day after tomorrow or next week or two weeks from now, we'll, uh, a lot of that detail, we'll wait till we get there. But thank oh, you for calling you. and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. How you doing, Mr. Campy? Very well, thank you. Uh, I guess I got, like, uh, two questions to ask. Uh, I just lost my 22-year-old son on July 10th. We were listening to your program maybe 10 years ago. We kept him in the house as much as we can, drilled him with the Bible and your teachings and everything. And you know what? He he was just you know what? I honestly say he knew he was a sinner, just like I am. And one day he told my wife, my wife was telling about because we heard about the end times, and he, he, my wife was saying to him, reading up scripture, and he says, "Ma, I'm a swine. Don't cast your pearls before me." And that crushed us. And what I was thinking is, you know what? He knew he was a sinner, Andy. When you say you're a swine, I mean. Wouldn't you God see him as a sinner? Like, and ain't that who he comes to save is the sinful people? I mean, he didn't put on and think he was. And I realized, you know what? He could have cried for mercy all of his life. It would be God who would save him. No? So your question really is, I wish I could know whether my son died as a saved person or not. Right? Well, uh, you know what? Honestly, he was a sinner. But if God was going to save him at the end, he would have. But you see, we cannot know. We can't know the heart of a person. But you know this. First of all, if he was not saved, he is dead. He will never have conscious existence again. He got whatever enjoyment or advantage for, that he could from this world as long as he lived until he was 22 years of age. And now he... Uh, there, he, he, well, the moment he died, there was, there, he'll never, never consciously suffer at all if he died unsaved. If it should be that he died saved, and only God knows that, then it means that he is with Christ in heaven in his soul existence, and he will be forever in the new heaven and the new earth. But you just have to leave that with the Lord, and, and uh, you can know at any rate that uh, the old-fashioned uh, the, the idea that the church age taught, which was altogether wrong, altogether wrong, that if we died unsaved, that we're going to be resurrected to stand for the judgment throne on the last day, be found guilty, and be cast into a place of terrible torment forever and ever, that absolutely, absolutely is not true. It is altogether a wrong teaching. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping? Yes. Hi. You know, um, the word Adam, um, from the word Adam, you get the word adamant, meaning uh, stubborn, hard, uh, hard or willful. You also get the word, from Adam, you get the word diamond. Now, in the Revelation, it mentioned a sea of glass in heaven. I think it described heaven as a sea of glass. Now, could that be a, a diamond that was polished by God, and the believers are just ro uh, diamonds I, in the rock? I, I don't know. I don't know anything about that. Uh, the, the, uh, the fact is that the sea of glass is... 
is representing, if I remember correctly, the, the sea of glass is representing the absolute purity of God, the absolute purity of everything that God does. But uh, and, uh, if uh, the, God did use diamonds along with many other precious stones to illustrate the glorious uh, and the precious and co costly nature of the gospel, but uh, the sea of glass, I think, is, is emphasizing the purity, the total purity of the of the nature of the gospel. Well, Mr. Camping, I just thought it was curious that from the the diamond comes from the word Adam. Well, that what? may be that may be so, but that's not that that doesn't we don't get that that's not a biblical word, adamant. We just don't find that in the Bible. And so uh, as we look at the uh, the uh, the formation of words Yes, there can be things like that, but it has nothing to do with the Bible itself. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello, Mr. Camping. My question is concerning Matthew 10, verse 15. Matthew 10, verse 15. There we read Matthew 10. Verse 15. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Which city? The city is, and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words when ye depart out of that city or, or, or shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Yes, now what is your question? My question is, doesn't that verse seem to indicate a resurrection for the dead for a judgment day? Well, if where that... There will be, uh, where, where, some, where some people will be judged harsher than others? If we just had that verse, we surely could conclude that, but we know that that is not possible because when we're dead, we're dead. Uh, but we do know that there's one more aspect of God's uh, judgment process that the individual does not ex uh, uh, experience in his own in his own feelings, but nevertheless, it's an integral part of the judgment process, and that is shame. Remember when Christ hung on the cross, he was shamed. He was uh, he had become a curse. Uh, he was stripped naked so that uh, there was enormous shame. And shame is an integral part of the judgment process on the last day or on the day of the, of the, uh, of the uh, beginning of the day of judgment. All the graves are going to be thrown open and whatever is left there, the, the corpses or the bones or the dust or whatever is left there is going to be thrown out and desecrated in the eyes of God and anybody else that God wants to have uh, be viewing that like other principalities and powers and that is the shame now these people here who have heard the gospel they have a knowledge of the gospel and therefore there is a, uh, as part of their punishment there will be shame that Sodom and Gomorrah did not, will not uh, when they're bones or dust or whatever is left of them are thrown out, uh, they, uh, they are not going to be shamed to the same degree because they had no knowledge of the gospel. They, uh, except for uh, Lot and his wife, they, they had virtually no knowledge. But here is someone who you've been bringing the gospel to and they don't want to listen. And uh, yet, uh, this, uh, and so this will add to their shame. Even though they personally will not be alive to to experience it. They, they will not feel the shame, but it doesn't. But nevertheless, they're going to be enduring that shame. Shame if they don't experience it. Then, really, what's the point of it? I'm sorry. If if the dead don't experience the shame and the wrath of God uh, at that point, then what's the point of it? 
because that's God's plan. That shame, just like, for example, example, why are we so concerned today when Saddam Hussein died that his body be not desecrated? That would be a shame to him. Is he going to feel it? No, not a bit. Well, then, what difference does it have? Or does it, uh, is it what happens to his body? Well, because that is just the way it is. Man was created in the image of God, and in his body he is also uh, that he is not to be shamed. And and uh, so, even if a despicable criminal is executed. We are careful not to desecrate his body. And if, uh, but Christ, on the other hand, is carrying the judgment as far as possible, namely by shaming also the leftover after death. But let's pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to open forum. Yes, Mr. Campin, thank you for taking my call. I have three short verses. Maybe you can read them, and then we'll ask a question or two. First uh, Timothy, chapter one, verse four. First Timothy, chapter one, verse four. There we read: Never, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. Now, what is your question about that? Let's go to Titus 3, and then verse 9, and then I'll ask the question. Titus chapter 3, verse 9. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Don't you use technology to arrive at your timeline? I'm sorry? Don't you use genealogy to arrive at your timeline? Oh, no. When it's talking about genealogies, the number one, there's in a, particularly this was true in the Jewish mind, to be able to show that I am from the tribe of Levi or I am from the tribe of Judah, or whatever it is. And, and they were, tried to work through, show their genealogy, genealogical line. Now, the, whatever the Bible discusses, well, that uh, all Scripture, remember the principle, the command, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for uh, reproof and correction and and, and uh, teaching and training in righteousness. And so if the Bible is discussing uh, a genealogical question, of course uh, that is something that is important for us to study. But uh, it's talking about, um, well, <laughs> let me use a silly, a very silly illustration. Uh, it's uh, like, People can argue how many angels can be put on the head of a pin. has nothing to do with the Bible. It's just a crazy question. But there are questions that do arise in the minds of people that are, are not, not answered anywhere in the Bible. They don't relate to the Bible, really. And yet they really think that they have an important issue that has to be resolved. And, and no, we don't get into that. If it doesn't relate directly to the Bible, then let's not, let's not, uh, let's not worry about it. First uh, John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. 20, verse 27. And verse 27. First John chapter 2. Verse 27, we read, uh, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now what is that? What, are you, what is your question? 
See, well, if you're anointed, you you anoint, you have the anointing, and that should be enough to teach you. You don't have to rely on a man to teach you anything about God. Well, see, here is the, here is the issue. I can not cause anyone to believe the truth. I can tell them what I read in the Bible, but that does not mean they will understand. In order for anybody to have truth, God has to open their spiritual eyes, and that's God's business, and that is the anointing that we need, That because the Bible is a spiritual book, and uh, like uh, um, I have loved ones, as there are, all of us do. I have friends, and they don't they don't follow what we're teaching right now at all, uh, and and they uh, uh, no matter how whatever occasion I have or opportunity I have to talk with them, they just don't understand. It doesn't register. They don't see how it's important. In other words, I I can't get them to to understand. But I can pray for them that hopefully God will open their eyes. And that is the anointing that we need in order to come to truth. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please, welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Champion. How are you? Very well, thank you. Okay, could we go to uh, Psalm 144, verse 11? Psalm 104, verse 11? Yes. Let's look at that. Psalm 104. No, 144. Oh, 144, verse 11. Okay. There we read. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children whose mouth speaketh vanity. And their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. Now, the question I have, uh, the word right hand, I've been trying to uh, uh, find out what it truly means. I know that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father when he ascended to, 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 to God, to the Father. What could that well, mean? Uh, ordinarily, the right hand is superior to the left hand. Remember the the um, sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, that parable, the sheep that are the true, represent the true believers are on God's right hand, and on the left hand are the goats that are, represent those who are not saved. And again and again, when we see that word right hand, it is the arm of strength. It is the superior hand. Now, here God is talking about those who are bringing their best, their right hand, and yet it is false. It is not trustworthy. In other words, no matter how how appealing it may sound, how legitimate or how logical or whatever, if it's not the truth, it's not to be listened to. But th- uh, that would, at least is one one way that we can look at that. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Kempin, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, my gentleman called earlier and wanted to know what Jebus meant. Jebus, G-E-B-U-S. And that's an old name for Jerusalem. Remember the Jebusites dwelt there? And, oh, uh, Jebus, yes, that is the name for Jerusalem. I remember that now. And uh, I don't, uh, uh, that must come from the, either the Greek or the, uh, the uh, probably the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, language of the Old Testament. Uh, uh, but uh, that's, that, yes, it is, it is from the Old Testament, the Jebusites, uh, because that was the, that was the name uh, 
of those who occupied Jerusalem even before Israel occupied Jerusalem. You know that the Jebusites didn't yeah. actually drive out all the people. Later on, uh, when David um, came to the throne, he, um, well, his general, his general um, drove them out. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. That we, uh, but Je Jebusites identify completely with Jerusalem. And thank you for sharing that. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Harold? Yes. I think you're doing a wonderful job. Keep up the excellent work. Uh, did you have a question? If, oh, our lady, our caller is gone. Shall we take our next call? Thank you for calling. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Carol? Hello? Hello? Yes, go ahead with your question. I'm on with, I hear myself on the radio. This is my question. Now, me and my mother has this debate. What about. is your question? Okay. In Hebrews 10, 24, it says... Oh, I'm sorry. You're going to have to speak up because otherwise we can't understand you at all. Hebrews 10, 24... Uh, uh, let's turn to that. Hebrews 10:24. There God is talking about what happens during this final period when God is, is uh, uh, again saving people outside of the time of the church age because he says in Hebrews 10:24, uh, uh, and let us consider... Well... Uh, 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 let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And the word provoke is used in a place in the Bible that indicates that it's going to cause a lot of contention. And when we start teaching in our churches uh, that we are, that the church age has come, that's going to bring a lot of contention, not uh, provoking. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but it says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves uh, as the as the manner of some but exhorting and so much the more as you see the day approaching and it's talking about assembling ourselves that is one by one uh, with uh, with Christ Himself. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Can I ask two questions, please? Yes. Can you go to Jeremiah chapter seven, verse twenty-seven and twenty-eight? Jeremiah seven. Verse 27 and 28. Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hearken to thee. That God is instructing Jeremiah that he has to speak to Israel of that day, which is typifying the word of God coming to the churches of our day. Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hearken unto thee. Thou shalt call unto them, but they will not answer thee. But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of Jehovah their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished, then is cut off from their mouth. Now, what is your, your question? I just want to know if it contributes to our day that... Those yes, that absolutely. All through Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and and Amos and so on is speaking about our day using ancient Israel as an illustration but we're actually with the end, the end time product or the end product of, of focusing on our day there are clues sprinkled through the, uh, these chapters that help us to know that it is speaking about this day not about uh, in the first instance about what is happening in the days of Jeremiah. They, that is just the example. Okay, can I ask one more question? Yes. 
Um, how did I don't know if it says it in the Bible, but how did Noah get the word out to we all don't, the people? We don't know. We do. The Bible does say he was a preacher of righteousness. We do know that mankind lived to be like 900 years of age in that day, and we can speculate, we can figure out in the 6,000 years that had transpired that maybe, uh, and, and we also know that in those days, they, the size of the families were about like uh, they are today. Noah, for example, just had three sons, even though he lived to be 950 years of age. And uh, based on that, we would expect that the world of that day, uh, and this is speculation, of course, might have there might have been a million people. And uh, they would have... Uh, and the nature of mankind is they're gregarious. They tend to, uh, except for a few oddballs that want to be alone and, and are out there somewhere, most of them tend to congregate very close to each other. Secondly, we can spe we know that he had been at this business of building this ark for 120 years, and it was such a huge craft on dry land, it certainly would have been the laughing uh, uh, piece of, of the world of that day. Everyone uh, by that time would have known there's this crazy idiot, Noah. He, he calls himself a preacher, and he's saying crazy things about uh, God's going to, destroy this world and he's building that huge craft and then as it gets completed and then they be, the word gets out they begin to see animals coming there because two by two they all uh, every species of the animal had to get on that on that ark uh, there would have been intense interest in what's going on so the likelihood is that uh, most of them heard him speak very directly that uh, uh, you have seven days now to get on into the ark because uh, uh, even as the animals are now going on the ark uh, because on the seventh day the flood waters are going to begin but we have to leave that to God's hand we don't know how that worked we do know again for example in the days of Jonah a city of 120,000 people, a single prophet Jonah, Jonah, 40 days to get the message out, yet the whole city sat in sackcloth and ashes and wept and cried before God. Oh, for God, is it possible? Is it possible that you might change your mind? And, and uh, so uh, we, we don't know how Jonah got it all, uh, got it out, but anyway... That we know the whole city did respond. Everybody heard the word, right? That Everybody the word. heard the word. And I think that in our day, but we, you know, we still have 20, just like a, a little one day less than 22 months. And, uh, and of course, uh, with, with our modern means of communication, uh, something happens in one point, place in the, uh, on planet Earth and almost instantly it is known all over the earth and uh, and w with all the means uh, radio and uh, cell phones and TV and uh, uh, internet and so on uh, I believe that by the time we get to the, uh, the last day every human being on the face of the earth will have heard this warning uh, even though uh, from everything we know in the Bible, about 97% of the people of the world will pay no attention. They will be in, they will just uh, continue, try to continue with business as usual. But they, the Bible does indicate there will be great fright everywhere. Fright it will be everywhere uh, as, as, uh, as people uh, hear about these things, even though they don't want to listen, even though they want to be in denial and are in denial, nevertheless, in their in their soul, there will be great fright. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Uh, Brother Camping, I called last week, but I, I, I wanted you to read me a passage. Uh, excuse me, if you called last week, please, 
wait for 30 days. We have a lot of people trying to call in, and it's not fair to others. So please, would you be kind enough uh, to wait your turn? And shall we go to our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, uh, Brother Camping. Yes. Um, I would... Um, I I'm, have been concerned or interested in uh, an idea here, and I wondered if you might read uh, Luke uh, chapter 20, verses 35 and 36. Luke 20. Luke 20, verses 35 and 30. 36. There we read. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage neither can they die any more for they are equal with the angels and are the children of god being the children of the resurrection now where where are you what is your question the question is this um verse 36 says neither can they die any more for they are equal unto the angels does that mean that the angels, and for instance, like Lucifer and his angels, cannot die? Oh, absolutely not. This is talking about the good angels God has. You Remember, we read everything in the light of everything, and the Bible clearly indicates that, that God's judgment comes upon the fallen angels uh, headed up by Satan. They will be all destroyed on the last day of the day of judgment. I got gotcha. you. Um, may I ask you to look at another verse? Or there's uh, two verses that are 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 very similar, and I wanted to ask if you would look at those. What what uh, verse is that? It would be um, the first one would be Revelation uh, twenty two five. Reve- Revelation twenty two verse five. There we read. And there shall be no night there, talking about the new heaven and the new earth. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God him giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. The um, That reign forever and ever, that seems to match up with the Revelations uh, chapter 20, uh, verse 10, at least in the Greek, they're the, they read the same. Well, the but forever and ever is throughout eternity future. God yeah. uses, uh, and and uh, but in Revelation 20, verse 10, they shall be uh, tormented night, uh, day and night, and the preposition for is the incorrect preposition. It doesn't fit the context. The context is, because we have to read this verse in the light of all the other information of the Bible. We know the context demands that it is to ever and ever. Day and night goes on till the last day of the Day of Judgment. That's October 21, 2011. Then everything is destroyed. This whole universe disappears. It'll never be remembered again. There is a now eternity future. It has begun and uh, they will be the, uh, the Satan, and will be uh, tormented until that, forever and ever, begins. That is, eternity future begins. He has disappeared. I understand. Thank you so much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Yes. I'm wondering if bones and bodies are going to be scattered around the world what happens if there isn't a body left if someone was burned or eaten by an animal what about the bones of which if someone doesn't have a body to come out of the ground to be scattered like oh the well if 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 yeah, that's why i say whatever is there it could be a, a corpse uh, if it, they've been buried recently it could be just bones that are left or it could be dust uh, whatever it is, whatever it is, uh, it will be desecrated. Uh, whatever evidence of that person having died because he died unsaved, whatever, if there's anything there, it will be thrown out of the grave and shamed. And if there is nothing there, if it's 
if they were uh, buried at sea and if a fish ate the body and then other fish ate those fish and, and then other fish ate those fish and until finally the, re- the remnants of that person are uh, where, where is it? Well, uh, it's pretty, there's not much there to be thrown out that could be shamed. And, but whatever there is, that will be shamed. But thank you for calling and sharing. And, and frankly, uh, the Bible simply emphasizes that, that as we read in, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 1. Let me just uh, read that again. We haven't looked at that verse for some time. It's talking about that time. Uh, uh, and we read in Jeremiah 8, verse 1, At that time saith Jehovah, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of his princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves and they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven whom they have loved and with whom they have served and whom they have served and after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshipped, they shall not be gathered nor be buried. They be shall be for dung, that is manure, upon the face of the earth. And that is a, a, a one description that God gives of the nature of the day of judgment. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yes, Mr. Camping, um, my question is, on a Sunday, if I'm devoting most of my day to God, um, would it be wrong for me if I want to color my hair or pick up a vacuum cleaner on that day? And also, um, am I not to confess my sins and ask for mercy to God on a Sunday? Well, you you know... The, the, uh, here, here is the here is the biblical statement, and you pray for wisdom as you read this. You 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 will have to answer your questions yourself. In Isaiah 58, uh, this verse uh, talks about the Sunday Sabbath, and it, it, he says in verse 13 if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath that is from doing what you want to do uh, 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 from doing thy pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight the holy of Jehovah honorable and shall honor him not doing thine own ways nor finding thine own pleasure nor speaking thine own words then shalt thou delight thyself in Jehovah and so now you read that of ten times and ask yourself, now, the question I'm raising in my mind, how does that fit into these, these words that we just read from Isaiah 58, verse 13? But now we've come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.